Welcome to the Talent Optimization Podcast, the go-to podcast for CEOs and HR professionals wanting to bridge the gap between the strategy and tactical implementation of talent optimization within their organizations. Through interviews, predictive index, and personal experience, your host, Tracy Shirk, helps you discover the facets of talent optimization from both a CEO and HR perspective to truly create the dream team for your organization. Are you ready? Let's get started. Welcome to the Talent Optimization Podcast. We are chatting about culture today, and my name is Tracy Shirk. And what we are talking about is those behaviors that happen over and over and over again in your organization, because that's how we define culture here at Elevated Talent Consulting. And I have some amazing special guests with me today. They call themselves the Boss Wall Prevention Specialists. And John and Sarah are with us from Real Good Ventures. And we met on an adventure at some point in time. And I'm thrilled to have them on the show to chat about culture and how they create great cultures by preventing boss holes. So welcome, John and Sarah. Thanks, Tracy. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure and an honor. Absolutely. So... I led with the boss hole prevention specialist, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Tell us a little bit about how that came to be and how boss holes impact our cultures. (laughs) Well, okay. I heard the the term originally from my amazing partner, Sarah, and we were in another office and I overheard her say this, Sarah, I don't even remember the circumstance, but you were referring to somebody and you said, boy, he's just being a real boss hole. And it just sort of stuck. And it was like, Mm -hmm. oh my gosh, that is, when you hear it, you understand exactly what it means. And and I love the way, Sarah, how you say, what is it about the word whole? You can use whole after any noun or pronoun, actually. (laughs) So it's universal. (laughs) It's universally understood and universally applied or applicable. Coach hole, parent hole. Pastor hole. There you go. But Tracy, I would say that it it really came from, I mean, we've both been doing this kind of work with managers and supervisors for combined, gosh, nearly 60 years. And it is one of those things where, you know, nobody, it's on our t-shirts, nobody is born to be a boss hole. However, sometimes they inadvertently wander into the boss hole zone or a company creates a circumstance where it pushes them there. We just need to have the conversation. and. You know, boss holes are the number one reason people are leaving organizations. And when we get them out of that zone and they do good work and and develop other people as managers are supposed to do, then people tend to stick around. So we just want to have those open conversations about boss holes and help those stuck in the zone kind of come on out of the shadows and be successful managers and developers of people. And that right there is creating a culture, right? Like, I mean, we're creating a culture that we have really high expectations of our managers and leaders, and we're going to set the container for them to live into that as well. For sure. So Sarah, you had made a statement at one point that culture is an outcome, not a remedy. And I'm so curious what you meant by that. Well, actually, John first turned me on to this idea. And I think in the work that we do, we try to educate and equip organizations to work against some very natural forces of disengagement. I mean, gosh, we've been measuring engagement for well over 20 years in our country, and the numbers have been in the pooper ever since. I'm sorry, my love to say that. They have <laughs> been <laughs> the very low numbers compared to other parts of the world, you know, like hovering around 35% of our employees are engaged. And by engaged, we mean emotionally committed to the mission. So there's something to be said about tapping into and creating more opportunity for people to expand the use of their discretionary effort for them to bring their best selves to work. And we believe that culture is a byproduct of doing the things necessary to kind of optimize that experience for the employees. And there's four things that we talk about. One is job fit. The second is manager fit. The third is team fit. And then culture, I guess the fourth thing, we believe is a byproduct of the first three. And it's not the thing you shoot for. It's how you are. It's who you are and what you do in your organization to optimize your people. I love it. And I'm curious, how have you seen certain or not certain, it, there's been a lot of things that are happening in our environment right now between mm-hmm. pandemic ended, we've got this work from home struggle. I feel like it's a tug of war thing going on, depending upon the industry you're in. We mm-hmm. have potential recession looming. We have things happening all around the world. How has that been affecting culture 
and what you're seeing day to day. I think when you look at the dynamics of how, let's just start with job fit. You know, when the pandemic hit and all of a sudden so many people went to a virtual or remote situation that modified or changed really the framework of a job and the technology we used, the norms or the different characteristics of communication or how we had to be more intentional about communication because we didn't have necessarily the personal interaction in the hallway or in the office or in the common area. And I think failure to really acknowledge that the new working scenario or situation also required a new way to manage. So I think it all began to really, not in all cases, but I think in a number of cases, a lot of managers and supervisors were not prepared for the shift, if you will, and how they would need to show up differently or manage their communication differently. And the culture couldn't help but be changed by a more virtual or remote environment, but our practices didn't necessarily change along with that. So I think because of that, we have seen just a remarkable increase of people that have left their jobs and sought other employment. But I think that the (laughs) issue is, is that we made the assumption that culture would be sustained even though we were remote and it required a whole different way of looking at it. Absolutely. And I think to piggyback on that, so I have a client where everyone is in-house because they're manufacturing and they brought me in, I don't know, six months ago, we had a conversation. They're like, work sucks right now. I'm like, well, what do you mean? They're like, COVID killed it. I'm like, how did COVID kill it? And they're like, we don't have the fun things that we used to have. We used to celebrate each other. We're still all on site. We've been all on site throughout the entire pandemic but work isn't fun anymore. Mm -hmm. So we started kind of going down the path of why is that? Let's look at all the different areas. Where we landed was their goals weren't aligned. And Mm -hmm. individual contributors did not have goals that aligned to what the team goals were, that aligned to what the department goals were, the plant goals, and then the overall company goals. So things as simple as goal setting and goal alignment somehow got lost through the Mm -hmm. pandemic. And so I think I'm doing nine or 10 presentations with this organization just on goal setting to get everyone on the same page. And they're still all in the same place. Nobody went virtual. And I think that that's what's so interesting here is that it's not just a virtual or non-virtual thing, but it's Mm -hmm. impacted so much of the organization. For sure. And it goes back to the very core and basic elements of just human existence. I mean, when not to quote Maslow from, you know, so many years ago, but safety and security, there was a lack of stabilization. People's worlds, their foundation was rocked. So Mm -hmm. whether they were working remotely or still in a place of manufacturing or a place of business where you had to be on site, everybody was worried about exposure and how do we mask up and take those precautions. I think we just really missed the need for that stabilization, the assurances that we are going to do everything possible to be safe and okay. It started to come around more, but I think it was more of an afterthought or we started to pick up on that message a little bit late. And therefore, I think people just felt like they were a little bit abandoned and a little bit sort of lost. If I could add to that, it is, I think, our human nature when uncertainty prevails, you know, when there's a lot of fear, maybe even fear that people aren't aware of, but they're experiencing a lot of that emotional turmoil as leaders. When there's that uncertainty and the heat gets turned up so that the Mm pressure is on, let's just be honest, this has been sustained pressure intensity for months and months and months and months, that it's natural to imagine that people default to a certain style of leadership and decision-making. And in many cases, it's it's kind of locked down, take control, command and control. And we've seen some organizations really struggle with creating, in the midst of creating stability, they also lock down and then become inflexible. So part of the the quiet quitting, the great resignation, all the buzzwords and terms we've been hearing to describe something that is not new to our organizations, we are seeing the need for leaders to adapt. We always say no one is born to be a boss hole. We are in an environment where it would be very easy for any one of us to default to probably what is not the most productive use of our natural behavioral drives. And I think we have to be aware of that because The result is that inflexibility drives out possibility and opportunity. It becomes less inclusive of different perspectives and what different people need in the organization. So that in and of itself presses down very much upon people's willingness to connect to their job and to the mission of the organization. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you hit on all the different areas, right? Because you just talked about culture and what their values are compared to the values of the organization, but yeah. also how are we leading? And yes. what are those teams that we're working together, right? Because when we are inflexible within our teams and how we're aligned, that also makes that really difficult as well. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm curious about just from what you've seen as well is how do you really go about evaluating this? So what are the things? So if we have leaders that are sitting here and going, am I a boss? Well, like, where's the mirror, <laughs> right? You know, how do they evaluate these different things throughout their organization to say, hey, what is the culture we're actually creating? And I think it's as simple as looking around, but sometimes you don't see it by looking around. So what would you mm -hmm. suggest? Well, Tracy, that, <laughs> that really speaks to how we've built our, what I call our technology stack at Real Good Ventures. And that is predictive index is obviously a key part of that. And the uh, employee experience survey gives us an opportunity to diagnose overall engagement and specifically job fit, manager fit, team fit, and organizational or culture fit. We've also added to it EQ, EQI 2.0, emotional intelligence and understanding and diagnosing a person's EQ. What is it? Their, what their competency and emotional intelligence, their Competent ability to adapt, their ability to uh, adjust you know, their natural drives to meet the moment that they face as a leader or as a yep. person. Mm -hmm. And then psychological safety, which we think that's one of our newer diagnostics, but understanding what has been created within the team, not just by the leader, but within the team itself in terms of that interpersonal safety to be able to challenge the status quo and voice dissent and challenge and, and make mistakes, the safety of or destigmatizing failure. And then we also have uh, another diagnostic called line of sight that measures organizational health. But the whole point is rather than guessing at it, you know, and you understand this, Tracy, based on the work that you do in your practice, let's not guess at it. Let's have objective data to be able to pinpoint exactly where are we succeeding, but where are we struggling? Where, where do we have these mm -hmm. gaps? And let's focus on that right now. And I actually wanted to circle back to something that I found shocking relative to culture. And this was actually out of PI's most recent CEO benchmarking survey. Mm -hmm. And they asked the executives, do you believe the great resignation is over? And 33% said yes, 36% said no, 20% weren't sure. This is the thing that just shocked me. 11% asked what it was. Mm. And I'm thinking, okay, mm. over 10% of our executives, according to this data, either weren't paying attention. Granted, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they just were so busy and focused on this that the great resignation was not even an issue. I find that hard to believe, but I think that's indicative of the fact that we still have some executives out there that are unaware of what's really happening on the front line and understanding of the impact that it's going to have on their business. Yeah, absolutely. And so if you're interested in the CEO benchmarking report, we will have that linked in the show notes so that you have okay. that so that you can access it because there's some amazing staff in there. And I that's a great one that 11% don't even know what's happening. You know, and it's like, hey, this diagnose tool, hey, let's figure out what's actually happening in our organization. I um, will often combine the predictive index diagnose tool with exit surveys. And I'm actually speaking to a board tonight about those results of the exit surveys as compared to the climate surveys, which is the diagnose tool. Mm -hmm. And it is amazing how you can predict what turnover is going to be based on diagnosing what's happening in your climate. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you can follow up by team as to what's specifically happening. So when you're paying attention, there's so many tools out there for you to really dig in and pull the right levers to figure out what's driving the disengagement. How do we correct it? And guess what? What I have found in my practice is when we pay attention to those things and say, hey, we see that this is a potential issue, what you need, they want help mm -hmm. and they don't know how to ask for it. And I see that over and over and over again. And Tracy, that speaks to what I believe about most people who are working is they wish to deploy their discretionary effort to the greatest good of yes. whatever mission or ministry they serve. They don't necessarily want to come to work. A very few people, I think, are going to come to work and say, yeah, I just want to do the bare minimum. Like, I'm just going to get by. What creates that happening oftentimes is a very poor culture mm -hmm. where the right hand and the left hand are not in sync, where leadership is not in alignment. I just this morning was listening to, you may be familiar with Adam Grant, great mm -hmm. author of several amazing books. He has a podcast called Work Life. 
And he was talking about the four sins of work culture. So I was like, oh, anything about culture, I like to tune into that. Mm -hmm. But let me just share what they are. Toxicity, mediocrity, bureaucracy, Mm -hmm. and anarchy. So as he walked through these, I'm like, yeah, that disengagement manifests in so many different ways. All four sins or any inappropriate or ineffective culture is the byproduct of doing stuff that doesn't optimize our people. And it's not rocket science to address and fix these issues. I mean, sometimes I feel a little frustrated. Our industry, the leadership development scope of work, billions. I think when I heard numbers back in like maybe 2017, it was like $470 billion a year we spend on leadership development. But yet, you know, sometimes it feels like we're not really moving the needle. But these are not difficult, very complex things to figure out. People can be understood. People can be optimized when, in fact, we put them in the right seats when we equip managers with the tools they need to understand who they have and how best to lead that person. I had a conversation this morning with uh, not really a client, but a partner organization that we like to support. And it's so evident that the chief leader of this organization isn't wired for conflict or difficult decisions. All the things that somebody like Patrick Lencioni would say are required of a leader. His great book, The Motive, suggests mm-hmm. like if you're responsibility centered, if you're willing to sacrifice and take on a bunch of heat and have some really difficult stuff, then you're made to be a leader. If the other part is what appeals to you, the status, the title, the pay, you're in the wrong seat. But in this particular case, we do that. We elevate people to positions that they're not capable to serve. And then we get mad at them too. Like mm-hmm. you're really bad. Well, I shouldn't be in the seat to begin with. But then right. I notice once leaders get into that seat, it's really, really hard for them to say, yeah, I don't belong here. I think they almost wish somebody would come along and say, how about we put you out of your misery? How about if we move (laughs) you over here? This is not fun for you. And it's certainly not fun for the people that you're leading. And they may not be equipped. So it's one thing to put the right or wrong person there, but if we haven't even given them the tools to do this. And I think when it comes to our executive leaders out there, those in the C-suite, I think when they think of culture, I know that they agree that it's critical. We want to have a healthy organization and a healthy culture, but I think it's very nebulous. I think it's kind of squishy and ethereal to some, but it's not. I mean, you can measure all the variables that build up to what a strong culture is. We can measure all of that. Mm -hmm. And if they just realize, look, let's be objective about this and look at all this data and then understand, okay, this is where we are, but what kind of culture do we want to build here? Do we want to have one that is cultivating or innovation? Is it focused on production? And chances are you have different divisions that may have a variation or a permutation of those, but stop guessing. That's the thing that we talk about, Tracy, is just please stop guessing at it and sort of using your gut because rarely is that accurate or reliable. Absolutely. And I think that this is a good spot to kind of get us to start to land here. which is what is that key takeaway that you have for the executives that have listened in today? This is going to sound like an indictment on decades and decades or a century of business management practices. I think we've created a framework that just keeps repeating itself and we need Mm -hmm. to change the framework. There is no business issue that is not a people issue. We all talk about that and we understand that. So if we Mm -hmm. got much better at understanding the people and job fit, manager fit, equipping and putting the right people in management roles, rather than those that maybe just sort of thrust themselves forward, being more thoughtful about it and using that objective data. We're talking about transformation of the workplace. And Mm -hmm. I think that's what's required right now. That's what I think the takeaway is. How can I truly reinvent the workplace to meet the goals that I have and with the, the amazing people that I have here? And by the way, Maybe there's some people that we need to offboard and make available Mm -hmm. to a better role for them where they will be fulfilled Mm -hmm. and we'll find people that actually are a better fit for this organization. I think that's what's required. Absolutely. And it's looking at that and saying, what is in the best interest of my people, even if it's not here? Right. And then we create those amazingly happy alumni, right? And they help us to bring in the right people that are the great fits for us as well. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And if I could just add one final thought, you know, it behooves every person who manages other people to look within and to recognize, wow, if there's a question mark in your mind, you know, am I a boss hole? By the way, we do have an episode. I think it's called seven signs. You might be a boss hole. That's a good one. But if you have a question mark in your mind, chances are you might be. 
And how cool to go ask people for some feedback right. to demonstrate vulnerability and courage enough to say, I don't want to be harmful. I don't want to be caused in the matter of making bad stuff happen here. I want to get out of the way and make good stuff happen. So there's that. Starts with self-awareness. Absolutely, for sure. And what's the takeaway that you have for HR professionals listening in today? Well, you know, I personally have a soft spot in my heart for HR mm-hmm. leaders because they are stuck between a rock and a hard place. That consummate battle of trying to roll a boulder up a hill, trying to help business leaders understand the true nature of people management and talent optimization. And I think some HR professionals, you know, they're kind of stuck in the zone of we got to follow protocol. We got to design this thing that works. But if nothing else, trust your experiences that you know data helps put people in the right seats. We don't just need a job description. We need an understanding of what is expected. How is this role supposed to function? And then what can we do to better align not a briefcase, not a big fat resume from some great company or school, but this person and how they work, how can we make sure that that's aligned with what the expectations are? And how can we set them up to win? I support HR leaders who really work tirelessly to help business leaders make better people decisions. And I personally would love to see HR elevated to truly more of a talent optimization role because that's what they are. They are the catalyst for talent optimization. And, you know, there's a a new website, Mm leadwithto.com. And it's just a great place to go learn and immerse yourself in talent optimization and get to the table and say, we're not here to talk about human capital, human resources. Some even still say personnel. We're here to talk about talent (laughs) optimization because that's what's going to differentiate a successful company from ones that are just struggling and crawling along. Yeah, absolutely. And that distinction between strategic and tactical HR, we just did a podcast on it. We'll link that along with the lead with TO and the Adam Grant in the show notes. So all those things will be there. But with that, there is this, what is strategic HR versus tactical HR? And tactical HR is still needed, but that strategic HR really is, how do we optimize the talent inside of our organization Mm -hmm. to ensure that people are fulfilled in their roles? So Thank you so, so much. And if you want more of Sarah and John, you can find them on their podcast, which is the Boss Hole Chronicles. And I was on that. That was in June of this year at some point. This year is a great episode. Yeah, it was. We had a lot of fun on that episode. (laughs) And if you are that HR professional that's going, how the heck do I do this? We have our talent optimization membership program where we have one of our talent optimization certified and HR certified professionals every Monday at one o'clock central that is really there to support you and implementing some of these really fun things inside your organization and doing it in a way that optimizes your people so that they are fulfilled in their work and you are too. So with that being said, thank you so much, John and Sarah, for joining us today. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Talent Optimization Podcast. You'll find more tools and resources for CEOs and HR professionals looking to bridge the strategies versus implementation gap of talent optimization at elevatedtalentconsulting.com. We've also created a free, valuable resource for you to begin bridging the gap called the Talent Optimization Foundation Membership Program. You can access it for free at elevatedtalentconsulting.com forward slash foundation. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode to learn more about talent optimization and creating a dream team for your organization.